Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. David Morgan. David is one of the most popular commentators in the industry. He is an expert in precious metals. He holds degrees in both finance and engineering. He is the publisher of the Morgan Report, which specializes in money, metals, and mining. David has been featured everywhere in the mainstream media from CNBC to Fox Business News to the Wall Street Journal. We are excited to have him on the show today to get his update on what he sees happening right now and in the future of precious metals, especially in terms of silver. David, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Michelle, I'm fine. Thank you. We are excited and thrilled to have you here. It's always so interesting to hear your perspectives and your updates. Now, you have been predicting for years that silver will be the top performing asset of the future. And here we are in 2020 and we are there. Silver is the number one best performing asset class of 2020, followed by the NASDAQ 100 and then gold. Do you expect this picture to stay the same right straight through the end of the year to December 31st? (laughs) Great question. The answer is I don't know. Do I expect it to? Well, that is tough. I would say probably not. I think we're in a consolidation phase here, and I think we probably will get a blip up um, after the election. And uh, then I think we might might get uh, an up and down. It's really hard to know. I mean, I'm guessing here. I want everyone to know I'm guessing. My concern is this. The uh, tax loss selling, I think, will be rather significant in, uh, you know, tax loss season roughly through the month of December, especially the last few weeks. And I'm also worried about an overall market correction from the general stock market in November. So we might see the metals go with the, the general market if that's correct. And I think it is, but we'll, you know, time will tell. So I'll leave it at that. I do appreciate what you said, though, that uh, silver's finally, you know, got the bit in its mouth and it's starting to run. And it made quite a move. And now it's uh, worked off the, let's say, overbought condition temporarily. It's going much higher long term. And now it's confining a new range. So the high premiums that we saw back a few months ago or weeks ago have um, still are there, not quite as high in some uh, parts of the silver market retail wise, but uh, no bullish long term. But boy, these are tough calls during these times when things just go up and down so rapidly and any news feed will take a market up or down. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's just incredible how fast they move on any news. With that said, let's turn to politics. Um, Because right now, we are less than one month away from the elections. Now, our president tested positive for the coronavirus, and then less than five days later, he left the hospital stating that there was nothing to fear, this was the flu, and he felt strong and fantastic. But his initial announcement, Dave, that he and the first lady had tested positive really rocked the markets all over the world in almost every way. So from your perspective, what kind of impact will the outcome of the elections have upon the economy in terms of interest rates and the dollar, and then indirectly in terms of precious metals? Well, that's a mouthful. I am pretty certain that I'm going along with the uh, the majority and the majority expects no matter how what the outcome of the election is it's going to be followed with a bunch of social unrest i don't know to what level uh, if it'll be quiet protests or more than that so i anticipate that gold primarily reacts to uncertainty or those type of situations so i would expect as i said earlier that after the election i expect the metals will rise <clears throat> Then, as far as the dollar is concerned, gold generally moves vis-a-vis the opposite direction of the dollar, but not always. It's really more negatively correlated to the stock market than it is negatively correlated to the dollar. But 
Uh, I think the dollar is really in an interesting spot. I mean, people like myself have, you know, forecast for years that the demise of the dollar is at hand. And, you know, it doesn't mean the dollar goes to zero. I mean, these banks are not going to give up their monetary control ever if they can. I mean, they're going to move to a blockchain. They're going to go to a capitalist society. They're going to do whatever it takes to maintain the control that they have. But they also know that the days of fiat are, are numbered. So the transition is going to be quite interesting. I expect to see higher gold and a weaker dollar after the election. And again, as I said, just to repeat, it could be short lived if we get a stock market, not call it a crash or a, a big uh, downturn in the stock market. I, normally, these elections, regardless of what administration, if it's D or R or whatever, in in the administration, you'll see the stock market be pumped up going into election day. And that's, I think, to be expected again this time. Once that's accomplished, regardless of who, what the outcome is, you usually see a letdown afterwards. Now, if it's going to be immediate, um, in November or not, you know, it's kind of a tough call, but I have a suspicion it may. Right now, the stock market is held up just by a few stocks, and the major tech stocks really got sold off pretty hard recently. And that was a big indicator to me that, uh, you know, we're getting close to as much upward pressure as we possibly can, and, and it has exhausted and once it exhausts, it doesn't take much selling pressure to drive it down and drive it down hard. If you look at the on balance volume, meaning what's the general stocks doing throughout the entire market, you'll find that many are going sideways to down really aren't doing that much. But the masters, the money masters, they know how to manipulate things. And one of the easiest way to manipulate the stock market is just by the leaders. And then that is weighted. And it gives you a reading that you basically want. You can basically place it wherever you'd like. As I've said many times, but I think it bears repeating, there's very little correlation between what the Dow Jones or the S&P 500 reads and the general economy. The general economy is nowhere near booming. And yet you have these you know, all-time highs and near all-time highs in the stock market. It's almost it's almost a negative correlation or a, a negative indicator. You know, stock market high, economy worse. I'm not saying that's true, but it's almost true. Right, right. You said so many um, things there, so many great points. Let's go back to the social unrest, though, that you see as a good possibility. Um First of all, which way are you leaning? Who do you think is going to win gut instinct? I think Trump will probably win. Okay. Okay. So you see the um, Democrats as being the social unrest. I frankly do too. Um, even if the Democrats were to win, I don't see the Republicans as apt to do a social unrest. I'm, I'm trying to stay neutral. But what I do see is Democrats actually supporting and talking about bailing out of jail criminals who burn down buildings and who loot stores and who murder people and who walk through neighborhoods and with, you know, burning torches and things like that. You know, I just uh, I can't see a party supporting that other than the Democrats. What, what are your thoughts here? Well, it's very tough. I mean, I, you know, I like to be, as uh, Gerald Salente says, a political atheist, uh, you know, but you can't be anywhere in the world and not have some, you know, politics affecting your life. I do these weekly perspective updates and one of my members thought I was, you know, a big Trumper and I'm not. And so in the last one I did last weekend, I talked about my mentor, one of my mentors, one of the main ones, Harry Brown with an E that ran on the Libertarian Party for president of the United States twice, I believe. And his you know, basic thesis, there were seven points. I read them all, just the, the first sentence of each one. And the first one, of course, is government is force. It didn't say the Democrats are force or the Republicans are force. It's government is force. And a lot of cases, government will force you to do something you wouldn't on your own volition do. So my point, Michelle, is 
I want to stay neutral. What we really need, and you know it and I know it, and I think both sides know it, if you want to say there's two sides, is unity. You know, we want to see what we have in common, not what our differences are. But the mainstream press particularly is really good at stirring the pot and making sure that everybody knows that, um, you know, one side is this and that's, uh, you know, they feed this idea of division and they feed the idea of emotion or the emotion itself. And this makes the divide wider and stronger. And that's very unfortunate because really we do have more in common than we have not in common. And, but for take, I don't know what it would take. I would say it takes a powerful leader, but I'm not sure that's true. I think it takes a powerful education of the basic principles that we have uh, to unite us again. And I think we've lost sight of those. I mean, the old adage that common sense is very common. You know, it is the same country. And what I like to use it as an analogy is, you know, the basic premise of general rules that are guidelines for everyone's benefit. And that's the traffic laws, right? When you're on the road, you're going to stop at the red light. You're going to stop behind the crosswalk. You're going to let people cross before you move your automobile. And I never am on the road thinking there's a Democrat or a Republican in front of me or behind me or whatever, right? And this is the way it really was outlined. I mean, we have the same rules, laws, and accountability for everyone, which means that the same rules, laws, and accountability apply to the president of the United States or a senator or a congress critter or your local sheriff or the chief of police. And the problem is that's not really true anymore. It really is, and everyone knows this, if you've got a lot of money, you can, or a lot of political power or both, you usually can weasel out. So it isn't the same rules, laws, and accountability. But if it were like the traffic laws, then we'd be moving toward what we consider, or I'd say I consider a just society. So we've fallen far from where we started. And not that we were ever adherent to it perfectly, but much more. And I'm old enough to know that, you know, being born in the early 50s, I know what it was like when the 60s and 70s, and you just didn't have this idea that you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and all this emotion surrounding politics. And really, <clears throat> excuse me, and really the idea was that he, those that govern least govern best. We're supposed to be independent, independent thinkers, critical thinkers, and go on our own way and be left alone and have minimum traffic rules that were easily understood by all so that we could go about our daily adventure in this life of ours as free individuals and respect each other and their ideas. So that's my long-winded but very heartfelt analysis of what went wrong. <laughs> I love that. The less you govern, the better you govern, really. I mean, it's so true. It's so true. I, and I think we will get back to everybody, you know, considering each other and love because it's just the basis of love. I don't mean to, you know, mm -hmm. sound like a flower child, but, you know, when you love and respect yourself, mm -hmm. when you love and respect yourself, that's where it all starts. And everybody, then you start seeing what you love and respect with everybody else. And it becomes a beautiful situation. And you're right. We're just here to play. We're just here to enjoy our lives and play. And that's the truth. We've lost sight of that. And um, we're such fabulous creators. But let's go back to precious metals. Um, I want to talk about the bull market. Um, how far along do you think we are right now? Are we 90% down the road or has it just started? What's your timetable? Oh, I think we're pretty far down the road. I mean, I've done numerous lectures. I'm almost tired of saying it, but, you know, anybody new or, you know, it's a very important principles are always worth repeating. But, you know, Jeff Christian years ago, one of the early conferences that I attended and he was there said, you know, 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. And I thought about that and I go, you know, I think he's right, at least the last bull market. And sure enough, I did the math. It's very simple arithmetic, but I think the move was uh, 87 and a half percent of the move came in the last 7% of the time is the exact math. And it depends where you put the starting line and the finish. Finish line is pretty easy. That's the day it topped. 
where do you put the start? That's a little bit more of a challenge. But in the last year in the silver market of 1979, January to 1980, we went over 800% up. And it didn't have nearly that kind of a gain for the previous 14 or 15 years. And I think the next market will do something similar. Don't get uh, addicted to the idea. It's going to be 90% and it's got to be 10% of the time. But if we had a, boy, uh, the market's been going from 2000, uh, 252 gold print to over 2000, not, you know, in U.S. dollar terms. It started in 2000. And most of these cycles are about 17 years long on average. We've got a 20 year bull market. So if we say that's 90% accomplished, 10% of 20 is two years. So do we have two years left? I don't know. Maybe we have 10 years left. I feel we only have maybe two, three years. I've been saying, you know, three, four, five, but I think it's really more like two or three. And then we would see, you know, a lot more than we're already seeing. Probably the implementation of a cash society, a move of the U.S. dollar into a digital only, which it primarily is now, but in a, in a hard sense. And uh, this whole way of tracking, tracing, and taxing everyone through the distributed ledger and uh, competing currencies. Some will be allowed to exist, some won't. I mean, a lot of changes. I expect a huge amount of change in the financial system over the next three years. I expect the precious metals to react to that very positively. And actually, I believe they'll spike. Now, silver particularly will spike in my studied view. Gold could go up and, and level off if it is implemented as part of the monetary system, which is likely, but not as I'm not as certain about that as some of my peers. I used to be. I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, I know what the powers that be want. They want to cast a society and they want no backing whatsoever. And they want unlimited ability to, you know, electronically produce their coin or <clears throat> their digital unit without limit. Modern money theory we will just, you know, make up whatever we need to control society the way we we want it to be, and you can see it's moving that direction with the universal basic income. I mean, the idea that, well, there's not enough work for everybody and or we've got the situation where, you know, we need to hunker down. And therefore, you know, just by being able to breathe, you're going to get this amount and that will sustain you barely. And that's the way it is. That's the quote unquote new normal. So, so many things. I mean, this you know, I'm a pretty deep thinker, Michelle, and, you know, it's it's a lot of thought to go through the possibilities because there's so many of them. But the general outline is less freedom for the people, more control for the monetary and political class. Wow. Over the next three years. That's my look. I, you know... That's it. You asked. That's what I see right now. Of course, you know, I'll get beaten up if it goes five or ten, but I don't care. The other thing I just want to interject here is that, you know, I'm pretty good at market calls, but not perfect. No one is. But as I get new data, I will alter my view. And, you know, I can't know that ahead of time. I don't have a crystal ball. So if I see something substantial, let's say in the blockchain world, that really is um, – adversarial to the power mongers and really does give us more freedom. Uh, that would be a big, you know, look by me and I'd probably change my opinion or something. But right now, the way it looks to me, I call it as I see it and that's how I see it right now. Right. So do you think the coronavirus lockdown was a precursor to a cashless society? Yes. Yeah. I think it's all about control. And the idea of how much control do they have? I mean, you could say, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It exists. What I am also saying is, was the degree of uh, implementation of these rules required for the amount of actual quote unquote pandemic that was experienced? I say absolutely not. So if the powers that be knew that ahead of time, and I suspect they did then it would be more of a test case, a trial balloon, as it's often referred to, to see how compliant will the population be. And if the population is generally this um, compliant, 
let's take a few states out there and really ratchet it down and see what the reaction is there. Let's see how much pressure we can put on the people and what the reaction will be. So, you know, this is probably conspiratorial or whatever. It's called critical thinking. I'm not saying I know. I'm not making an assertion that it is this way. I'm asking the question, why was it done? And was it done to get feedback to determine what their control ability is? So that's it. That's called critical thinking. It's not conspiracy and it's not an assertion of some something I think and I, I assert it's true. I'm asking the question. Oh, that's a very interesting perspective. And, you know, um, what's happened here has to be unprecedented in history. I mean, absolutely. I have to interrupt you. I mean, this is so far beyond anything I thought of. I mean, I was very clear on the destruction of the monetary system. And, you know, it's a global phenomenon this time and all that. And I won't harp on too long, but I never forecast um, this kind of a control. I just didn't. I didn't see it. I saw it from a monetary perspective. I saw a cast of society. I saw, you know, the banks having more and more power. Um, but I didn't see that they'd be able to take everyone to basically hunker down in their homes and lock the door, more or less. And that is a first uh, ever. So I don't think you can over uh, emphasize that I that fact that uh, here we are in some place that we've never been as a human race. It's not just the U.S. It's everybody is told by the authority figures to do what we say. We say, don't go out, wear a mask, you know, and, and then, and then this other area, you know, some areas it's worse than others. I mean, Australia, for an example, is just beyond belief dictatorial. I mean, uh, this woman that got beat up on the street for not having a mask on when she had an exemption. I mean, I, I'm getting my blood boiling just thinking about it again because it was totally uncalled for. And yet that video went viral and it, it has two purposes. I think one is that, you know, we're your rulers and don't go against us. And even if you're in the right, doesn't matter these days, because as I said earlier, same rules, laws and accountability are out the window. We've got the protection. We've got the billy club and the helmet and the, you know, SWAT team gear. And you're just a, a lowly citizen and we rule over you. It's very sick. I mean, this police state is something that, you know, unless good people stand up and are willing to do what that woman did inadvertently, you know, this is the direction we're headed. I hate to say it, but that's what I see. And I just told you, I don't, you know, I don't sugarcoat too much. Right, right. It's just shocking. And we're going to get into how to protect yourself. Um, and I think precious metals and the miners but just to wrap up this sort of topic, it's very shocking how compliant people are. I mean, and they will force everyone around them to be compliant, too. It's almost you don't even have to rely upon the police. It's like if, if I have to wear a mask, you have to wear a mask. That becomes a very toxic um, premise because if one person with an attitude who's a bully decides they're going to buy into the situation and they're going to wear a mask and they're going to force everyone else around them to wear a mask. Then you have the population fighting among themselves, which um, is just, an, you know, it's an advantage to the people that have decided that they have the right or the position to govern over everyone else in the world. And I have to stand back and say, where did you get the idea that you have the right to govern anyone else, let alone entire populations. Our representatives are supposed to be elected by us to represent us because everyone else is out being an accountant or a nurse or following their careers. So we choose one person and we say, okay, we're going to pay you because we know that your job will be representing us. We've lost that entire, they work for us. We, and now all of a sudden they're the elite and they make the rules. And they, it's a complete shift that needs to shift back. And you're right. Um, it's, a, it's a very dangerous situation to be in right now where someone, a woman, I think she was pregnant. I think she, I think she, if, if it's the same situation, there are several different situations, honestly, that are happening. But they don't care. 
They don't care who you are or what you're doing. You can be alone out in the park. Yeah. Right. And if you're spotted, and that's, see, this, is, this has nothing to do with the virus. No. That's where the, that, that's where it gives me chills. Yeah. Because this obviously has nothing to do with the virus. Therefore, it's something else. Anyway, let's turn back to um, the miners of precious metals. Because a lot of people are saying this is an insurance policy or these are insurance policies, especially the junior miners, um, for people to put their money right now so that they have something, you know, um, that's very affordable because many times you can buy these pennies on the dollar. Where do the miners fit in your totem pole of investing? What do you think of the junior miners? Well, for me, I take um, first things first, and I always advocate having, you know, physical metal first. And doesn't it, you don't have to go overboard. And then I break the Morgan Report down into the top tier, mid tier, and speculations. Speculations are great if you're right, but so often they're hard to know ahead of time how they're going to perform. So I put big money in big companies, medium money in mid companies, and on the speculative side, I bet a little to win a lot. If we are lucky or skillful enough to find one, two, or five that do really well, I use the analogy of a horse race. Uh, if you bet at a horse race before the race starts on a 100 to one shot, and 90% um, <clears throat> through that race, your horse is in the lead. In fact, it's in the lead and it's you know three furloughs ahead of all the other horses. If you could go back to the window and put another bet on that horse, because you only bet five bucks, now you know that sucker is going to win, or you're pretty sure you could put in a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks. Now the odds wouldn't be a hundred to one anymore, but they probably would drop to ten to one or whatever. And so you could rebet and put more on it and come out a big winner. So that's how I play the speculative game. If a company starts to move and there's a reason for it, like uh, Western Copper that changed its name to Western Silver, it's got a bump by the name change. And then when I discovered the Penasquito mine, it was bought by Glamis, and uh, then that was bought by Gold, Corp, Gold Corp. That situation, you know, once that stock bumped up significantly, it's my job to analyze, you know, how close to the finish line that horse is. And it was a far, you know, it was very near the finish line, but very undervalued relative to what the market was saying. So it was actually, you could put in significant money there. So bet a little, win a lot. And if it's going to win, then you can actually add to your bet, you know, not overboard, but significantly. So I don't know how many in the industry do that. Um, and, it, you know, and it's a, a good way to do it. In other words, you know, let the market tell you I've got a winner here. Now, are you going to make more money if you made that long shot bet on that horse? Yeah, you would. The problem is there's only one winner at the race. Now, Dave, you mentioned a couple moments ago that you saw the prices of physical metals really shooting high. And I want to go back to that topic right now. What's your perspective? What are your predictions? And what are your timelines also right now? And I know these are going to be fresh because everything's changing as we go. But what are your updates? Yeah, I think we're going to see a big move in uh, 2021. I think that's going to catch um, the metals really on fire as the public, you know, some of the public is awake and some of the uh, smart money is starting to move in the metals. I mean, you see a pension fund come into gold and that's just the beginning of probably a big run to gold. So we'll see, um, I think, significant moves in 2021 and we could peak as early as, you know, September 2022 as an example uh, where we get an exponential move up like we already saw in 2011 for silver and September um, 2011 for gold. I think that uh, the miners have a unique space because if the physical market tightens up as much as we've already witnessed, there'll be people that really don't care to buy the physical metal or find it unaffordable or don't want to pay the premium. But so many people have access to a stock account, so they'll go into their into the share world and they will buy a gold stock or a gold junior stock or a silver junior stock or whatever. And with the amount of money floating around, they're seeking a safe haven eventually. And that eventually isn't too far out in my view. 
you could see a run into the metals like we've never experienced. 2003 or four, when I wrote Get Skinny on Silver Investing, I forecast $100 silver. And that's when it was at like five. So that was a 20 bagger on a metal itself. Right now, the HUI and the XAU are not outperforming the metals. And as Mike Maloney and others have pointed out, there are times when the metal itself does as well as or actually better than the underlying equities. But in a really big bull market, which we are experiencing the third leg of, as far as I'm concerned, the anything gold goes crazy. It's sort of like what the general stock market has done or what the real estate market did in 2007 or what the technology stocks did in the 90s or Japanese in the 80s or Japanese stocks or whatever. So we're going to see all of those things kind of uh, added additive. I mean, think about the Japanese stocks plus the tech stocks, plus the housing boom, uh, all combined because all that money that's in those sectors decides that, you know, the place to be is precious metals and there really isn't much else to go to. Think about that. I mean, the uh, paper price on these things could be, I say could, not would, rather mind-boggling. So we'll see. Uh, I, you know, we've already got clear indications not only on really smart money that's talked about the metals, silver in particular, in my view, but we've seen action. We've seen, as I said, that pension fund, I forget the name of it, but I think it was a state run or a fireman's fund or something that moved. You know, I think it only moved like 5% or something into the metals. And Warren Buffett, who basically was a gold hater, moved into uh, <clears throat> Barrick Resources and the amount that he put in would be significant money for any general investor, but for Berkshire Hathaway, I think it was like one half of a percent or something. So, you know, there's a lot of money out there that could move into the gold and silver sector. That's really an interesting point because once, I mean, we're already seeing shortages <clears throat> on physical delivery and um, from the COMEX and whatnot. So it's really interesting point if, you know, all of these, bigger pension funds start to sort of wake up and come into, especially physical um, mm -hmm. metals that could really impact the market hugely. And to see Warren Buffett do that, even though it was a half a 1%, I mean, you know, what if he wakes up and says, Hey, let's put in 10%. Yeah. That could really overnight that could have a huge impact. Talk about what that could do to the market. Well, in 1968, and no one could prove this, the general uh, thinking amongst financial planners and financial analysts was that about on a scale of how much asset allocations were provided, <clears throat> gold held about a 5% position. So everything else was like bond stocks and real estate. Now we know, because we have better data and it's easier to measure, that the gold part of the financial system is about 1%. So if we went back to what happened where we were in 1968, that'd be a five-fold increase in gold ownership. And that would be more than a five-fold increase in price because it's an exponential function. The higher it goes, the less shares are available or the less physical metal is available. So, you know, you get the general idea. And I think that's going to happen. I think, you know, when all is said and done and everyone's racing out of fiat and, you know, trying to get rid of their real estate, some areas will be going up and a lot of areas will be going down. But people will try to deleverage and move into safety. And when that takes off in a big way, it's just now starting. Then you could see, as I said, this parabolic move up, which I expect is typical of the third leg. Like I said, 90% of the move in the last 10% of the time. I mean, if you go back to that idea and you were buying silver in January, 1979, you're paying $6 an ounce and you were paying an all time high price ever. You know, I'm paying the highest price silver's ever sold for in nominal terms, nominal terms. And now, you know, it's going to go up eight fold to 48, 50, in a year? I mean, you told somebody that in 1979. I don't think there are many people who would have believed you. In fact, they would have called you a crank. They would have said, you know, you need some medication. What are you talking about? And so that's the type of moves that these markets can make. And 
there aren't too many that are aware of it, really. I am. I lived through it. I experienced that. In fact, gold peaked on my birthday, believe it or not. But um, that's the whole deal. Uh, so I think I'm probably a little lost. Michelle, maybe you should reel me back in. <laughs> well, you know, I want to talk about specific prices. What do you see silver doing in the next? Okay, let's go with the three years because right. you felt that the yeah. three years was impactful. Yeah. I mean, I'm anxious to say it. I think we'll see at least 100. I think 150 or 200 aren't out of the question. But, you know, I don't want to be sound like that crank at $6 silver. You know, it's like people don't accept those type of ideas usually. But uh, <clears throat> it's so incalculable because of the amount of silver that's available and the potential with uh you know, the amount of money that's already come into the silver market this year through the ETFs. And that's just a precursor to what could take place with the uh, pension fund. It's, you know, you guys want gold, but, you know, we're way behind on our fund. In fact, we are so down. We, we are like 90% short of what we need to pay out. We're going to take um, 200 million and put it in the silver market and see what happens. And if it moves the market, we'll put it in the other 500 million, you know, or whatever. And all of a sudden, there's something that goes, wow, you just saved our pension fund. You know, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, these are just ideas. But what I do know is there's going to be a lot more fear in the market, like we talked about in probably in November. And people instinctively know something about the metals, even if they're negative to it intellectually at this point in time, there'll be converts that will come back and get the gold story and actually you know, convert to the idea that sound money does have a place, especially during a financial crisis or a currency crisis. And we're facing that. In fact, we're in it. We're in it right now. Yeah, it's real interesting. They're actually creating the market for precious metals. They started with the repo, with all of the printing, yeah. and then letting that get out into the public. And um, now talking about the cashless society, and, you know, everybody's in lockdown, and the markets are going to crash <laughs> they, are, they are creating this market i think that's what's so extraordinary and probably makes it a very unique time also now you're seeing triple digit silver what about yeah. gold and for gold i see uh five thousand as a minimum i mean if the bank of america will say three thousand near term uh, you could probably double that, you know, and then, of course, if you do the arithmetic of, you know, ounces of gold that are purportedly held in the U.S. Treasury versus the M1 money supply, and you do that simple arithmetic problem, it comes out somewhere in the uh, 15,000 units, fiat units per ounce of, of gold, and that's just with the, you know, printed money, actually, you know, so or M1, I should say, checking book, checkbook money and, and printed money. But we're, um, we don't know. In 1980, it, it actually did that and doubled it. In other words, if you took the M1 money supply divided by the amount of gold the Treasury said it had, it came out to $400 the ounce. And we know it was 800, uh, over 800. So that would be, you know, we could add a full gold cover in 1980 if we locked the price at 800. Uh, we didn't, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm an advocate for, you know, sound money, or at least the idea of, you know, sound fiscal principles that are same rules, laws, and accountability for everyone, especially the banks. But anyway, back on point, I think gold could probably go to 5,000 as a minimum. I don't rule out 10,000. I know that may sound like a crank now, but again, all you really have to think about is gold is a fixed supply and fiat is infinite. So if you really get your head around what the bond market looks like, and it's basically worthless paper at this point, but no one will admit it. But once the market starts to admit it, you know, the reason, I mean, it, there's a lot of reasons why the interest rates are low. And the primary one is so governments could keep printing and, and keep paying the interest to the banks. But when something doesn't cost you very much, it doesn't have much value. And interest rates are the cost of money. And the cost of money is practically nothing. So what does that tell you? How valuable is the money if it costs you nothing? Think about it. Dave, what is your best advice for everyone right now? 
you know, my best advice is to live within your means if you can. And I'm very heartfelt that there's many people that were living within their means and all of a sudden their means change because now they're out of a job and they may not ever get it back. So that's number one, you know, after living within your means, save if you can, try to always pay yourself first. And education, be aware. I mean, no, there are people, I've said this before, I don't want to say it again, that they have uh, significant and precious metals that won't be able to cope with what I see coming ahead. I hope I'm wrong, but let's say I'm correct or partly correct. They won't be able to handle it because they're too, um, they're too connected to their materialism. They're not free enough mentally to be able to adjust to the anti-fragile mindset that I will take to get through what potentially I see coming. And there'll be people that really don't have any breast mouth holding that will be able to weather the storm because they have the right attitude. So it really comes down to the attitude. I mean, that's one of the few things we can control about ourselves. We are in the most interesting times that are also crisis and opportunity. So seize the opportunity. And sometimes the opportunity is actually helping someone else. You, if you're in a good place, and someone else needs your help, you know, that's very satisfying to be able to help another human being. I'll say one real quick one about, you know, the top of the mountain. I was in an exercise years ago where we divided into four different groups and we had to get to the top of the mountain. And I was probably in my forties or so, and, you know, still pretty strong and type A and, you know, our group's going to get to the top of the mountain first, you know, when you got up to, you had to build this little thing. So we, you know, it was a whole day trip to like eight or nine hours to get up there. And, and I made it to the top and not many did. And when I made it to the top, I had this epiphany that will change, change my life because I realized it meant absolutely nothing. So I went back down that mountain and I got as many of my teammates as I could. And I pulled them up. I pushed them up. I got one lady that in polite terms was overweight. I got behind her and I pushed her up the mountain. And what I realized was that it isn't me getting to the top of the mountain. That meant nothing. What meant something was helping as many people as I could get to the top of the mountain. Beautiful. Dave, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everyone about your reports, your website, and how to follow your work. Yeah, this is the easiest way is just go to the landing page, themorganreport.com. I do a free uh, weekly perspective and also all these interviews I do like this. And we're actually um, starting to write again. I've got someone helping me with the writing part. So I'm on more websites again, like uh, Kitco and others that publish uh, written work. So I've got written work again and all the videos and uh, audios that I do during the week. And then I do my own little podcast once a week to wrap up the financial markets and usually end with something about the precious metals. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show today with your update. My pleasure, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, we'll have you back soon. Mr. David Morgan, precious metals expert and the founder of the MorganReport.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Mm -hmm. 